Welcome to another edition of Explain Your Take, a Sports Me signature podcast with me, James A. Paxson, and of course, my co host, Josh Ross. We got a very big show today. We have a lot of discussion. We have some serious topics. We have some football topics. We we figured today's show was just too big for just the two of us between Josh and I. So we brought in two very intelligent people. We have Robbie Foley, who is incredibly smart when it comes to football. We're going to get some of his football takes later. And then we have the founder of the Sports Me Podcast Network, Mr. Samuel Jackman. How are we doing, boys? We're doing good. Yeah, We're good, good. Friday. Yeah. I mean, yeah. complain. Especially for you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate Josh. He's doing the podcast well in a car right now. So that's dedication. That is really a lot of dedication. It's crazy. So Wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing the podcast a little differently. You know, usually Josh and I spit some takes, hence explain your take. So I got a bunch of questions here. I'm going to give the guys and we're going to talk about a lot of football related stuff. And then at the end of it, I asked all three people to bring a take or a question for the discussion today. So it'll be a real fun time before we could get to anything I wanted to talk about. We need to uh, talk to Josh Ross about his uh, Miami hurricanes. Cause last week was not, not really great. And I'm curious where your head's at there with the, with the U. We're going to be fine. We played Clemson, the number one team in the country. Any other team not named Alabama or maybe Ohio State gets blown out as well. It's it's not really – I'm not worried. We'll have a nice bounce back game against Pitt. If we lose against Pitt this week, then I'll start being worried. But I look at our schedule, and the only other game I'm nervous about is UNC, which is like the last week of the season. And if we can win that, we can face it. Plus in the ACC championship game, and it is always hard to beat a team twice in the season. So you're not worried at all about De'Ara King going forward? No, they, they were playing in the storm. It was pouring out during the game. And they were playing against the number one team in the country. They, De'Ara King will be fine. He's allowed to have a hiccup. He also came out after the game saying that was one of the most disappointing games he's ever played, and he's looking forward to getting coached up and working hard. So I'm ready to see him explode against Pitt this week. Robbie, I want to get your take on what the main topic is for the Miami Clemson talk. Is Clemson just so much better than everyone else where it's getting to be Clemson ahead of everyone? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you you see this happen. It feels like every year there's that one team that everyone's like, who can beat them? They should be they should be playing, you know, the Browns because they're so good. They're beating everyone in college football. Usually that's Alabama. This year it's Clemson. I think this uh, this Clemson team looks really, really good, but I don't think they're invincible. I think there's some time there's some times they've looked a little rough around the edges. Trevor Lawrence has had some uh, struggle when it comes to a good pass rush on him. Um, you know, when it comes to Alabama, Ohio State, Miami, some of these other teams, they can put up a fight, and you know they look invincible. But uh, if you look close enough, there there's a real true ability to be able to beat this Clemson team this year. Sam, do you believe Clemson's only as good as they are because of the conference they're in? If they had to play in the SEC, would they look different at all? I think conferences has a lot to do with how with how Clemson has has been doing over the years. Um, if they were in the SEC, they would have a lot better competition. But that doesn't take away from just when you know just from that whole program, just in terms of their coaching. You know, Dabble Sweeney. And then, and then you go to the number one pick in the draft this year in Trevor Lawrence. So I think, a, I, I think it has to do with the conference. And, and I don't think a lot of people um, take, more, take that more into consideration, to be honest. Yeah. Are you guys saying the ACC is not the number two conference in the country right now? Because it is. No, that's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying but, that the I mean like everything everything other than the SEC is going to be considered weaker than them. And I think the SEC is in a down year this year too. And if you look at the ACC, the ACC has like four top 20 four or five top 20 programs. They have obviously Clemson, they have Notre Dame, they have UNC, they have Miami and they have um is it NC State? They have one other team that's ranked. I forgot which one. But it, it, I mean, it's not like 
it's the Big 12 or the Pac-12 where it's a little weak. Clemson's playing some good teams. Right, and I'm not saying they're not playing any good teams. It's just I was more asking would it look different in the SEC because I think we can all agree that the SEC is a much harder competitive conference than the ACC. I, I, I don't think it would. I think maybe if they'd have to face like Alabama because I think they'd still beat up on Georgia. I think Alabama and Georgia are the two top teams in the SEC right now, and I think Clemson's better than all the other teams – all of the teams, including Bama, but I think Bama would be the closest fight. So when we talk about Dabo Sweeney as a coach, I'm going to go to Robbie, then Sam, then Josh. Where does he rank on the best coaches right now in college football? And then maybe best ever. Is he starting to be in that category? He's got two national championships. He's 10 and six in bowl games and he's only 50 years old. So he has a lot more coaching left to do. I'm going to start with Robbie first. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when it comes when it comes to current coaches, you know, in college football, um, he's definitely in the top five. You can place him, you know, based on your preference where you think, but I, I don't think there's any doubt that he's not in the top five currently. Uh, when it comes to all time, I think he still needs to do, you know, there needs to be some more improvement, some more work, another championship, some more bowl games. Because, I mean, when you look at that list, you look at those guys that are in the Hall of Fame, the best college coaches. They're there for a reason. They have some really impressive resumes. I think it's too early to crown him at that level. But, I mean, it's it's hard to find an argument where uh, he, he's not five for the current coaches. Sam, who would you put above Dabo Sweeney right now? Um, well, you know, in terms of active, uh, I would put him and Saban in the top two. Like right now, um, just again, just off of what Robbie just said, just based off bowl games, based off of national titles, um, you know, and like what you said, he is only 50. So he has a lot more time coaching left. So I would not put him in the conversation yet. Uh, give him another 10 years if he wants to continue coaching for 10 years, and then we can start to have that conversation. I'm going to agree with Sam on the first point. I, I like – He's definitely a top two coach in college football. I, I wouldn't take anyone other who's not named Nick Saban o, o, over him, This who's an active coach. And I think he is, like, if he retired today, he probably is a Hall of Fame coach. He needs to be – he needs to do a little bit more to get into elite, arguably best coach ever status. He needs to win a couple – he needs to win at least another championship and needs to w make more bowl games. Like, 16 bowl games is nothing to laugh at, but to be considered one of the greatest of all time at coaching, he needs to do better and win more bowl games and make more bowl games. Robbie, do you think there's any chance he goes to the NFL shortly? I think the number one team that he needs to consider is the Houston Texans because he would be able to coach Deshaun Watson. But is there any other NFL teams you think he should think about, or should he just stay put in Clemson because he's a really good situation right now? Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great question. That's a question we see pretty much every year. I mean, how often do you hear uh, people wanting Nick Saban to move up? Um, I know personally, if he was to move up, I think the Texans would be a great spot for him. I also think he could help turn around the Jets and really work with Sam Darnold there. But I feel like he needs to stay at college football. Uh, he's got something good going. I mean, we're sitting here talking about how he's arguably the second best coach right now in college football. He's building a resume to be a Hall of Fame coach. You go to that NFL level, it's a whole different game. It's unpredictable. Um, you, you've seen great college coaches go there and fail and have to go back down. Um, I honestly feel like he's got a great situation at Clemson. Um, he's got a great staff around him, and I think it makes the most sense for him to stay there and keep increasing his resume and keep winning with that Clemson program. Sam, anything to add on that? Uh, no, I mean, look, if, uh, I think the best coaching option for him in the NFL, if he were to go to the NFL, it would be the Texans just because of Watson. I think if he were, if he was to end up at the Jets, I don't think he would know really what to do per se, just, just because of how the disaster they are. And, you know, it's, it's not Sam Darnold's fault. It's, it is the coaching fault. So maybe he could turn it around, but I think he should stick, he should stick with college for now. Um, and I think he will continue to, I mean, you know, top, arguably top, top two, top three right now, he's getting paid 
one of the highest salaries. So why not leave? Like, why would you want to leave? You know, so. Josh, yeah, how much? Do... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, you're right. I think the only team that would even tempt him would be Houston for a chance to coach Deshaun Watson again, because we all know how much he loves Desha- Deshaun Watson. However, I don't think it's the right move. I definitely think he should stay in college just because the coaching, ch- the change from college to to the NFL, it's a big gap in coaching. The whole mentality is different because everyone who you, you're coaching is getting paid. They're getting paid big dollars. A lot of them are making more than you versus in college, you have complete authority over them. Like what you say goes bottom line and and in professional, it's not necessarily the case, especially if he's coming in and there's already a proven star or something. I, I think Deshaun Watson would be the only thing that would tempt him. But overall, it seems like you three are in agreement that he should stay in Clemson. Oh, 100%. Yeah, don't mess with the success. I would not, I would not try to go to the pros. He's killing it as it is. But why not risk his legacy to try to go to an NFL team where it's more unpredictable? Robbie, how much of a difference do you think Trevor Lawrence not being on the team in the future will make with Clemson? Because Sam did say it, and he's absolutely right. He's going to be the number one pick, and he's one of the best quarterback prospects we've seen in years. So him not being on the team, do you think that's going to make any difference? Or is it just next man up because Clemson's just one of the top five programs in college football right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't make a difference. It's going to make a difference. Anytime you lose a guy, especially your quarterback, that is the consensus number one overall pick, that's going to hurt your team. But with Clemson, especially with Dabo, I feel like, you know, that next guy up is going to be able to perform that role. I like to think kind of um, with Baker Mayfield and the Kyler Murray situation that happened with that, they both were huge top picks. Um, the next guy came up and they performed at that same level. And then that next quarterback got drafted and you even see what Jalen hurts. Like, it's just, you want to go to Clemson. You want to play quarterback for Clemson. Yes. It's going to sting. It's going to hurt a little bit. That offense is going to change, but there's so much talent at Clemson on both sides of the ball that that next guy who steps up is going to perform well, maybe not at Trevor Lawrence's level, but well enough to keep them a top five program for sure. Sam or Josh, anything to add on Trevor Lawrence before we go to our next topic? I think the biggest problem, because they've already gotten five-star, number one overall quarterback recruit in their pipeline. So I think the talent will be there. It's just you're replacing a three-year starter with a guy who has taken – who's taken very limited snaps. I think that's going to be the biggest difference. I think the talent, they'll still have a, a guy – maybe not equal talent because Trevor Lawrence will be the first overall pick. But you'll have a really high quality uh, college quarterback, but it's going to have a little bit of growing pains just because they haven't started. Um, I'll just say one thing. I mean, whenever Lawrence leaves uh, next year, I think for um, Clemson, you know, this will test, this will ultimately, ultimately be one of his biggest tests if he can, you know, um, stick with the program and hit for him to, to continue to have success with Al Lawrence. So I think, you know, for Dabble Sweeney, this is going to cement, cement some sort of legacy. Yes. I mean, you could say the same about have... Deshaun. Mm-hmm. When Deshaun left, when Deshaun left, you could have said the same thing. Yeah. That the quarterback, yeah. I mean, Brian Kelly or whatever their quarterback in between yeah. wasn't great, yeah. but he still found Trevor Lawrence. So you could say he's, pretty good at finding quarterbacks no i know it it, like if i was a clemson fan i would not be worried about um declining per se because of his because of sweeney's ability to find quarterbacks so yeah as we continue with college football here for a couple seconds i want to get everyone's general thoughts on how they've handled everything involving the coronavirus uh this weekend after this weekend it'll be 13 postponed games because of the virus uh, they've been able to do something successfully. They've been able to some stadiums to have some fans and it's been decently successful. Some things has not gone great since the 32 games have been postponed. 
Where are you guys at with how college football has been able to handle the coronavirus? I'll start with Sam and then we'll go to Josh or Robbie. Yeah. Well, regarding COVID and, and college football, um, I think this was going to happen. It was not going to be a flawless thing because again, college football is one of the, it is probably the sport where, you know, including college basketball and including college sports in general, it involves the most people. Um, so so you kind of expected going into it um, that there was going to be some some sort of influx of positive tests. Um, I think they've done a lot better job than I thought. I thought they were gonna it was going to be a lot worse to be honest. Um, but I think what was it? Sixteen games that were postponed because of positive tests. Thirty two. Thirty two. So I I was I was assuming it was going to be you know in the hundreds, but, you know, with, with all these pro protocols, um, as well as the PAC 12 and the big 10 coming in late, I think, um, they have done the best job that they could have done, you know, with a lot of turbulence involved. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know how else you can kind of try to contain the virus by just being in bubbles on campuses, but then you would have to travel to other campuses in, in your conference. So this was the best that they could have done so far. We have to wait and see about the Pac-12 and, and the Big Ten. That's a whole different story. Josh, where are you at with how fair the seeding's going to go when it comes to playoff and bowl games? You know, is it really fair to let a 7-1 and or 8-0 and Big Ten school compete with a team that was 10-2? and I Well, I'm sorry if you can't hear me properly. It's pouring right now. But – um, I think this year's – I mean, the college football rankings is always super subjective. I think this year especially it's going to be even more. And I'll, I also think it depends on the quality of the wins. Like, if Penn State goes out there and just dominates and wins all their games, I wouldn't have any problems with them making the playoffs over a 9-1 and one Miami team. I mean, personally, as a fan, I wouldn't like it. But as, like – just a fan of college football in general, I wouldn't be upset about that. If a team's just going out there and dominating, I mean, if you have a loss and you're one of the teams that have a shortened schedule, I think that automatically takes you out. I think that's what has uh, – that's what's the biggest problem with the teams that who are coming in late. I think if they lose a game, it should be equivalent to them having two losses on the season type of thing. So, like, if a team goes undefeated – it's like a Penn State or a Michigan, and they just beat up all the other Big Ten conferences. And Big Ten's not a bad conference. It's not as strong as it has been in years past, but it's not nothing. So I wouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, the Pac-12 itself is kind of weak. So, I'd, so I really wouldn't think any team out of the Pac-12 should make it, even if they go undefeated, just because who are they playing? Like, or if Oregon wins out, like, Who's Oregon playing? The Pac-12 is terrible this year. But other than that, uh, I'd be fine with the Big Ten team making it. Robbie, where are you at with the quality of wins and the strength of schedule? Are you in agreement with Josh on this, or do you have a different opinion? Yeah, I mean, personally, I struggle with it a little bit. I mean, I think quality of wins is huge. I, I totally agree with the shortened schedule. I think it's a slight to teams like the Big 12, who started the season have been playing their games and, you know, maybe have one loss and then a short and scheduled team comes in and has one loss and beats them into the playoffs. I don't think that's fair. I like the thought process of it effectively being two losses. Um, I think quality of wins is big, but I don't think you can count out a team just because they have one loss. Uh, I know the big 12 uh, is a little crazy this year. It seems like it always is not a lot of defense played, but I know, specifically like that Kansas state team has had a lot of wins is now ranked, you know, they slipped up a little bit. And I think a lot of it's due to COVID your first game, you're not getting the practice. You had COVID threw a lot of things off. I don't think you can count out those teams with one loss, even over some undefeated teams. And it comes down to the quality of wins. And if you look at K state, they've had some very quality wins and they're playing quality teams. The teams have the talent, the teams have the coaching, um, I think COVID just just strongly affects everything, definitely, and it makes it makes it a little crazy. But I think it's going to be interesting to see who gets those top bowl games and who makes the playoffs because I think it's going to be tight. Hey, Robbie, real quick, who'd you guys lose to again? 
Arkansas State. I think I think Miami's loss against Clemson is a little more understandable than losing to Arkansas State, even if it was the first game. Just had to point that out. Though. No, and I mean, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, you sit there and you look at that loss. That's a big difference. But when you have a team win out, especially in the Big Twelve, uh, there's a little credit due there. There's some really good teams in there. Um, just not a lot of defense. But a hundred percent, if your only loss is Clemson, and you are competing against, you know, an undefeated Oklahoma State for that last spot. Uh, honestly, with the Big 12 and where it's at, I think, I think that, uh, that Miami team wins out. Sam, where are you at with, you know, first-year coaches? You know, I, I'm from the state of Michigan, and I work for a team that covers and airs um, Michigan games on the radio. And the conversation of what Michigan State's going to be able to do this year is amazing because first-year coach Mel Tucker – what has he been able to do with the summer of COVID-19 by getting his team ready for a first year system? He's going to run a different offense and defense as years past. Can we expect anything out of these first year coaches? You know, I, I kind of, I don't expect the New York giants to be amazing, but I don't think they'd be on five right now. If Joe judge was able to prepare his team in a normal NFL season. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a whole other conversation with a uh, judge, but it like, in regards to um, Michigan State and first-year coaches in college football, I think it's a lot tougher than first-year NFL coaches, just because of um, just because of how everything is virtually. You can't really meet with them one-on-one, so you, you don't really know a lot of their characteristics, not just as a football player, but just as their personalities. Um, so it's kind of it's a lot more harder to get personal with them per se. Um, so I, you, you know, if I was a fan of any of these uh, programs and they have a f- f- first year coach, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned with what, um, with what they have because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're just trying to get football, you know, games played in general. So, I mean, this is also for me, you know, living in New York, we don't really have college football so I don't really know kind of a lot about you know the passion that a lot of these fans have in America so I mean for me as neutral I just want to see you know I just want to see games played you know the quality of play it can come you know whenever so if I was a first year coach I wouldn't be too concerned about being on the hot seat and like threatening to get fired etc Robbie and Josh, are you okay with kind of giving first-year college football coaches sort of a pass, or is it, look, this is the cards you were dealt, this is the way you got to go. I'll go to Josh first. I think in all sports, you got to you gotta take this season with a grain of salt if you're, if you're looking at trying to fire a first-year head coach. It's, they're trying to implement a new program, a new tradition, not a tradition, but a new mentality. So it's really hard to do that in general in your first year. And then, especially in college, they didn't have spring ball this year. Spring ball was just canceled. That's a huge thing of determining whether or not a guy should start, even just looking at development of players. So it's – I'd give them a slide. I usually like giving first-year head coaches a slide. I mean, if they do terrible, then you can be like, all right, well, you got to prove yourself a little bit more in this year, show some improvement. But I think this year teams get slides. I wouldn't really be too concerned if you're – coach looks that bad this year Robbie your thoughts on the matter yeah I definitely think Josh brought up a good point but looking at it another side it's not only about the development of the players kind of struggled with COVID but you also got to think of these first year coaches coming in uh, with a mix of you know staff that stayed and bringing in their own staff and their development as a coaching team and I think especially with COVID that's been a lot harder to do. And I think for these first year coaches, I definitely think it's not just about player development, but coach development. If you give up on a new head coach in the first year, what are you doing? You need to give him time to have growing pains. You need to give him time to show improvement, no matter how small it might be in that first year. And then that second and that third year is really where you look at it and make those hard decisions. Because if you bring in new coaches, new staff, and you don't give them any time to develop, set up and grow, you're, you're not going to have any success. You're going to be booting out everybody that comes in until you get, you know, the perfect coach with perfect resume from another school. And even if you don't give them time, 
you know, struggling to implement a new system, they're going to struggle too. So I feel like definitely with COVID, you have to, you just have to give a pass to these first year coaches because I think there's going to be significant improvement both with the players and the coaching staff in this next season. Also, to add, wait, to add on to that, uh, it also really hurts recruiting if you're going to keep getting rid of your coaches because a big part of recruiting is how the players like their coaches. And if they don't think the coach is going to last, then what's the point of them going to the school? No, it's a really good point by everyone. And Josh brought up the really good point of recruiting. You know, if a head coach is trying to tell you, come play for me, you know, I'm implementing a system and then he gets fired. I doubt many of those recruits are going to go to the college who just fired that head coach. Most likely, you know, they're going to try to get out and go to different schools. So I do think COVID brings a lot of problems to college football, but more importantly, the recruiting of it is really interesting because a lot of these players probably aren't really sure what's going to happen in the future. Moving on to the last topic I had here before you guys kind of run the show, we have a Kansas city chiefs fan and someone who lives in the area. And I think we're under maybe one of the more legendary terms of the NFL precisely if they're able to keep doing what they're doing. Robbie, as someone who lives in the area and a fan of the team, how are ways you see that the Kansas city chiefs are looked at differently on a local level than at as a national level? Definitely. I, I mean, you see at national level, you see everyone immediately thinking, you know, they're the next Patriots. They're the next team to hate because they're performing well. But when you look at the local level, you have to understand the struggles that we have gone through as Kansas city chiefs fans. We've had a lot of awful, awful years. We've had a huge quarterback carousel up into, you could really argue, Alex Smith. Uh, a lot of people locally either loved him or hated him because um, he was more a game manager. But when we finally got Mahomes, um, that was a big deal. I think a lot of people look at this team with just gratitude. Gratitude that we're finally performing well. Gratitude that our name's in the conversation. I mean, we're a small market. I mean, Mahomes has catapulted us into, you know, these huge – brand deals and he's becoming the face of the NFL but until then like no one really looked at Kansas City so I know locally we're very proud of this team we're very proud of the success and there's a lot of gratitude towards Andy Reid especially and our front office for setting this up uh, whereas nationally I feel like a lot of people just look at us as like the the next wonder team and that you know we're destroying the competitive nature of the NFL and just that you know no you know, the fans don't deserve this and they're bandwagon fans. But, um, you know, we've worked hard not only as a fan base supporting this team through the rough times to get here, but as a coaching staff, as a front office, and as a lot of our veteran players. Sam, are I, you want – go ahead, Josh. I just had something real quick on um, Robbie's last point. As a fan of the Yankees, nothing is more infuriating when someone calls you a bandwagon fan, when you grew up following that team. Like I'm born and raised in New York. I'm a Knicks, Yankees, Giants fans. I have some pretty bad sports. And just because people see I'm a Yankees fan, they assume I'm a Cowboys fan. Like that's the most infuriating thing. So I, I feel for you, Robbie. Sam, you're from New York. I bet you get some of the same thing. Oh, 100%, all the time. I, I can, I agree with Josh. I, yeah everything yeah, it's it's just so annoying how and it is in in infuriating you know i i live like a mile and a half away from the stadium and people still say i'm a bandwagoner come on you don't even know me like it's crazy what was your question <laughs> so at, at this point when you look at eric Bieniemy as the offensive coordinator of the kansas city chiefs he's got to be the number one available head coach looking forward in the NFL, right? I agree. Yeah, 100%. Um, he would be a great fit for the Jets. I can tell you that much. I mean, Gase being an offensive guru, no, he's not. The enemy is way better than Adam Gase. Um, anybody's better than Adam Gase, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, yeah, I think he's the top coach, top head coach prospect right now. Josh, what yeah, I'm – uh, I was just gonna, I'm surprised he hasn't gotten a spot yet. I thought he should have yeah. gotten one last year. And his only real competition for me would be if one of the college guys decides to try to go for the NFL. Like if Lincoln Riley wants to make a push, I think that would be the enemy's number one competition. 
Well, it was funny during the uh, Monday Night Football live stream, me, Sam, and Robbie were a part of that. And Robbie being someone who, like I said, he has the most Kansas City ties out of all four of us, he was wondering why Enemy would want to leave. He's got a very good situation as an offensive coordinator and working under Andy Reid for a very successful team. Robbie, are you still, like, under the impression that he may not go? Yeah, I mean – I think it really depends on the season. I think if they win another Super Bowl, I think he's paid his dues and he's ready to go. I know he was interviewing for teams, but then he ultimately decided he wanted to stick with Kansas City and keep this franchise going. I think, you know, part of it's probably afraid of, you know, with Bill Belichick and his assistants, we always see how his assistants pan out. And it's, you know, when you leave that program, you leave that success and you try to start it out on your own. It's difficult. I mean, imagine going – from the Chiefs, from running the Chiefs offense, uh, arguably the most electric and dyna- dynamic offense we've seen in a long time, to trying to run the Jets offense. I mean, career-wise, you can you could easily destroy your career. I mean, you can easily go into that and just get ultimately destroyed by both New York fans, your front office, your players. Where right now he's in a he's in one of the best situations an offensive coordinator could have. I mean, the amount of weapons he has, the amount of success they've been having. I don't blame him if he doesn't want to leave, but I think if they continue to win and add another ring, I think he will feel prepared and be prepared to leave. And I think Andy Reid will be ready for that as well and have someone to take that next spot. Is this the next worked with Belichick now, where if you worked with Andy Reid and had so much success with this Chiefs team, you're going to be looked at as the next best head coaching uh, prospect you know that happened with Sean McVay after his offense just went crazy I believe that's pretty much the reason Zach Taylor got hired with the Cincinnati Bengals was because he worked well with Sean McVay so is Andy Reid going to be the new guy I'll go to Sam first um I would say so yeah I mean then again this is the start of a dynasty if you want to call it um because you know they have Mahomes locked up so you know I would give him like another two two to three years before you see kind of, you know, a lot of Reed's personnel going off and becoming head coaches. Um, unless we do see a rise in college coaches wanting to work f- for the pros. But yeah, I think, I think he can be another B- B- Belichick and just start getting, you know, head c- coaches, you know, everywhere. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of too early to crown that. I mean, Belichick yeah, won like six Super years. Bowls. Andy Reid has won in his entire career. Yes, I think it's more of a Sean McVay type of thing. It's like you work under this amazing offense and you work with the offense. So now people are going to be like, well, let's see how this offensive genius does or quote-unquote genius. If you think about like Zach Taylor, who I thought was a terrible hire. I don't like him as a head coach at all. But going back a little bit, I think the reason why the enemy would want to leave the Chiefs is because he'd want a chance to live his dream as a head coach. I feel like anyone coaching the NFL wants at least a shot to be a head coach. I mean, not for the Jets, though. The Jets suck, and no one wants that job. But, like, for another job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would love to point out, though, uh, with Andy Reid's assistance, there's already been success there. I mean, you had Doug Peterson leave, go to the Eagles, and win a Super Bowl. So, just there. And I know the Eagles aren't performing – great right now but right there's a success story from an Andy Reid assistant who left and head coached and I think that's going to be the same story with the enemy when he leaves and he decides to leave and going forward especially you know with any offensive coordinators that come through that that's going to be the place you know NFL teams are looking because everyone wants to copy that Chiefs offense have that electric offense have that dynamic quarterback and those dynamic players and uh like you said, I know I know he's not at Belichick's level. Obviously, I don't think anyone's debating that. But he's already had success with, you know, an assistant leaving and winning the Super Bowl, which I think is is a massive success. And I think that's going to continue. And I think he's going to take that mantle. Yeah, I mean, he's nowhere near Bill Belichick's success. I just think we have to start thinking about when you talk about the new potential head coaches, you know, who's worked with the best, who's ran the best college program. And I think guys who have worked with Andy Reid on that Chiefs program is definitely one of them because they may have the start of something really great, 
or they may have what was the Seattle Seahawks a couple years ago. You know, they won a Super Bowl, and then when they played against New England and lost, that kind of somehow disrupted what was all going on in Seattle. So we could have a dynasty starting with Kansas City, or we could have, like I said, with Seattle, where it looked like something was starting, but then it all kind of just filtered out. I feel like that happens every time a team loses in the Super Bowl. Like, unless you're the Patriots and Bill Belichick, I think every time you lose in the Super Bowl, your team kind of doesn't do great for a couple for a little bit. It's good. like it's known as the Super Bowl hangover. Like everyone knows that, but like also if you look at like the Falcons since since they lost the Super Bowl to the Patriots, they've got nothing. Like so, I think if they just lose there, then I agree. Then they won't be able to really continue this. It's an interesting take. Um, that's all I got for everyone. I told everyone to bring a take or question to the group so we could continue this very fun conversation. Uh, Robbie, you go ahead and start us off. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I got a pretty hot take here with the addition of Le'Veon Bell to that offense. Um, and the way the bills performed, the bills were my biggest threat for the chiefs and their remaining schedule. I think the chiefs are in a really good position to win out. And I think they have a really good, really good route to only have one loss. And that's going to be my take of the day is that the Chiefs are going to win out the rest of their schedule. I would like to agree with that, but not because of Le'Veon, because of the Bills. I also agreed the Bills were the biggest struggle. I thought the Bills were better than the Raiders, and the Raiders were able to beat the Chiefs. But I don't think that it's Le'Veon. I think Le'Veon's going to have more of a secondary feature in the backfield. I think the ball's still going to mainly go to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I think Le'Veon's going to do well, but I don't think he's going to be the big reason why they, if they win out, I don't think it's because of Le'Veon. I think it's more because some of the teams like the Bills aren't looking too hot. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, Edwards Hilaire is now going to have a second option in Le'Veon Bell. So I think it's going to take off some of the pressure for Clyde. Is is Bell the reason why they're going to win out except for one loss and go back to back? No. Do I think they will do that? Yes, because of the Bills and how they struggled on Tuesday night. Um, but then again, you know, Bell just adds another just adds another um, offensive weapon, even though he literally like. Well, not, not literally, but he basically gained like one or two yards per one million dollars that he made as a Jet. <laughs> and the Jets are paying him to be a chief, which is just insane. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, the Bills, they were their top threat and they did not look good on Tuesday. So I see them winning out and going back to back. I, mean, I, also, I also don't think they will win out just because winning out is extremely difficult. I just think that if they would, it's more because of the Bills not looking hot. Like, they the did. Bills, I think, are the best team left on their schedule. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there's always a game, like, Patrick Mahomes can get hurt. Someone could get hurt. Like, people have off nights. And to finish the season 15-1 and one is extremely difficult. But you think uh, they'll yeah. be a top seed, right? Yeah, I think they'll be the number one seed in the AFC. A hundred percent. And it is difficult to win out. And like you said, I think it hits the nail on the head is, you know, Bell's not coming in and suddenly we're winning out. That's how I always felt. I felt our biggest challenge, my two predictions for our losses was we were going to play down to the Raiders once and we were going to lose to the Bills. And after watching that Bills game, I feel a lot more confident in us, especially Mahomes. I, you got to understand as a Chiefs fan, he doesn't like to lose. And I know he's young. But he takes that, and he takes that in stride, and he grows from that. And I think we're going to see Mahomes come out bigger and better than we've even seen this season. He's struggled. He struggled a little bit as defenses are catching on. But Bell just brings another offensive weapon. And honestly, what do you do as an NFL defense now with all these weapons? You can only focus on a few, and they've got six, seven weapons now. And that doesn't even talk about how we've been struggling in the red zone, especially goal line, running anything in. And now we have Bell. And I think it just adds another key implement to that. And it's, it's, it's less about, you know, the Chiefs' performance, but it's like how do you as an NFL defense 
cover those weapons and shut down the Chiefs now that they've added another key offensive piece. Also, as we're talking, Dalvin Cook has officially been ruled out for the Vikings game this weekend, according to Adam Schefter. Just just wanted to point that out there as we had some breaking news. I mean, it's very interesting with um, – with the Chiefs, I, I think winning out is incredibly difficult, but also I do think they're going to be a 13 and three number one seed. I've never been worried about their offense. I have been worried with the Chiefs on if they're going to play a team that's just going to be able to outscore them. That's kind of what happened to the Raiders. You know, the Raiders did score 40 points oh, with the breaking news by newsman extraordinaire Josh Ross. Minnesota was a team I thought was going to have a lot of ex- success at the beginning of the year, but now they've looked kind of very much like they're on the brink of just losing everything. And without Dalvin Cook, I highly doubt that offense is going to be as good with him. Yeah, I think I think it might actually open up their offense a little more. I mean, Alexander Madison's a really, really good backup. So I think they'll still be able to run the ball fine. Maybe they won't run the ball literally like every first and second down. Maybe they'll start passing the ball more now that he's hurt. But, yeah, I think losing him has definitely got to hurt your offense, especially when he is the main part of the offense. But we saw how um, Carolina's been doing without McCaffrey. So, we'll see. Josh, go ahead with your take or question for the show today. It's more of a plead. Trevor Bauer, please come to New York. I know you're probably not listening, but please come to New York. We need some starting pitching, and you're the guy. Hey, I I can't agree with you more. We need another pitcher because after Cole, who do we have? I mean, Tanaka? Severino, but he's a, Severino, Severino, Tanaka's a, Tanaka's a free agent. Severino will be back in July. Tanaka and Paxton are both free agents. I don't expect True. us to resign Paxton. I think Hap is also a free agent. So we yeah. have, like, Dave Garcia, who struggled at the end. I mean Clark well, Schmidt, but like we need we need another guy in the front. And no, Trevor I, Bauer, please be that guy. <laughs> Bauer would be a fantastic second second starter. Um, yeah, I mean we just need pitching at the end of the day, and that is what it's felt like for like every single season. But we do have Cole, who is a game one will win every you know almost guaranteed. So we we just need a lot more pitching in order to win four games to win a World Series at the end of the day. I think he's a phenomenal player, but you guys have to remember your franchise has a very certain way of people going about it. You know, you have to be in the New York Yankees way. And I don't know if that's going to be a great fit of Trevor Bauer, very outspoken, you know, erratic, (laughs) erratic going to the Yankees. Throwing the ball out, throwing the ball out to center field. And then he gets traded the next day. Yeah. We've seen stuff like this happen, though. We've seen the Yankees go after these guys if they have some controversy. Aroldis Chapman got suspended, and then we traded for him because he was cheaper. That's not – like, if you're going to say the Yankees' way, that wouldn't fit the Yankees' way. I mean, Reg, if you're going to say outspoken, like, I know this is, like, 70s, but Reggie Jackson was that way, and we still sign him to the biggest free agent contract yeah. at the time. So, I don't, I don't think that's really going to have a thing. It's not like he's outspoken against the Yankees. He's outspoken against the Astros. And everyone hates the Astros. Well, I'm more so. saying he's he's outspoken towards everything. I mean, you have to remember this is a team where you used to, if you had long hair, cut your hair. You have to, you know, do things in the New York Yankees state of mind. I think a signing of him would work very well, but there is a way of playing for the New York Yankees as different organizations in baseball. I don't think the organization itself will have an issue with him. I think the media would be my biggest thing. If he's going to talk his talk which he has been doing in Cincinnati he's going to get a lot more backlash in New York than he would oh he'll be on the back page of the post every single time New York New York is brutal with our athletes and I am one of them and I'm fully supporting (laughs) being as brutal as possible because we need to toughen them up but as he's gonna have he's gonna he said it in one of his like podcasts or live streams whatever he does he said He's heard the New York media is brutal, which it is, and he will have to he'll have to just prepare himself for it. 
Well, he's also, every single time any baseball team does anything possible, he tries to say, hey, you need a starting pitcher. So this guy's pretty much made him available to every single team in Major League Baseball. <laughs> that is true, except for, like, Atlanta and Houston. Okay, this guy's made himself available to 28 Major League Baseball teams. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'll be more technical. I think it'd be a great signing. He's a really good starting pitcher. I've always loved what he's been able to do on the mound. Just I don't know how New York would react to him being there. It would be exciting to see for sure. Yeah. Be a great second starter. I'm telling you. Sam, what did you have to bring to the table today? Uh, I Yeah, I had a couple things. I think I'll bring up more more breaking stuff. It's It, it does have to do with COVID. Um, Patriots had a positive test this morning. The Colts are having a lot more positives um, today as well. Uh, I think it's more personnel than players, but, you know, it's still in the system. What do you guys think how, you know, we were talking about college um, and how they are handling it. You guys think that the pros are handling COVID to the best of their ability? I mean, clearly not. We saw what Tennessee did. They kept breaking protocol, and if they, it was talk about if the game got postponed again, that they would just have to forfeit it, just because, like clearly teams, you're only as good as the teams are at implementing it and how the players are at trying not to break the rules. So I mean, it's working for some teams. Most teams haven't really had that many COVID tests, but the ones that are that do have it is getting a little concerning for me. I think we're going to get concerned with how scheduling is going to make things because they can only rearrange the schedule and give teams bye weeks so much where we're not going to know what to do except just add another week at the end of the season for these teams to play each other. I, I think the NFL has handled it decently, but not great or good. They have to find some ways to where they can try to eliminate it more than they are now. They're the only sport I've seen with as many false positives. You know, you brought up the Indianapolis Colts. It turns out those guys tested negative this morning. So Colts and Bengals are on for Sunday. But I, have, I haven't seen any other tests that's really false that, positive. That's also concerning is about the f- false positives because, you, you know, I think the Jets had this too the other week where you, you don't know if you're going to have a game and then you get a different result. So, so everyone turns out to be negative and in the NFL, it's all about routine at the end of the day. It's all about, you know, you have your own set um, schedule. So it just kind of makes everything and turns it into a influx. So there's also, there's always a lot of uncertainty in this year. Um, But I just don't know how they can do this any better. And Tennessee, Tennessee breaking breaking protocols is not the greatest look in the world <laughs> for the NFL. Um, practicing on a on a high school field is just not what you're supposed to do under these circumstances. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. I think in the playoffs they have to consider doing some type of quarantine, some type of bubble, something. I know it's really really tough because you got probably 100 100 people personnel per team but you got to do something in order to try to contain it and try to get try to get a full season in Robbie, what are your thoughts i i 100 percent agree i mean obviously it's a whole different scenario it's a lot less players but we all saw how the we all saw how you know the nba bubble went and how effective that was. And I think when it comes to the playoffs, they need to find some sort of way to have either a quarantine or some sort of bubble play in order to keep people healthy. Because that's the last thing we want to see is, you know, the Super Bowl get postponed because one of the teams playing in it all got COVID. Um, What's really concerning is false positives. Like you said, it did happen with the Jets as well. And that just totally can ruin preparation for a game. You know, when you have that, you don't think you're playing, and then all of a sudden you're playing again and you need to keep preparing. It can really ruin some game plans. Um, I think the NFL needs to be stricter. I think they need to get their tests figured out. They need to be stricter with players. Players are going to want to break protocol. I And you know what? I, I don't blame them. You're, you're making millions of dollars or, you know, you're in a contract year. 
Uh, you want to have your best performance possible. You're not going to want to take time off. You're going to find ways, loopholes to try to practice. And at the end of the day, everyone's going for that Super Bowl as well. Everyone wants to make their money and earn more money, and they're going to break protocols if the NFL lets them. The NFL needs to be more strict. Um, I'm not sure right now how to do that, but they need to figure out some sort of way to be more strict with these teams and these specific players. Because if you're not, they're going to find loopholes in order to get around that. Sam, what else did you have? Uh, I had one more thing regarding um, the Houston a- asterisks. And yes, I say the asterisks now. Uh, <laughs> um, they have won the last two games. And um, if they win tonight to go to a game seven, I think they're going to beat the Rays and move on to the World Series. Um Not thinking of fans, because I think a lot of fans that are not in the Houston area would love to see them lose. Um, In terms of executives, in terms of marketers for, we can probably say it's a dying sport in Major League Baseball. Um, It's still like the second or third most popular sport in the U.S. It's not, like if you look at the numbers of attendance, it's still very high, and people who are watching, it's just aging. I wouldn't say it's dying. I'm saying it's, I'd say it's aging. It's it, so. Then, can you call it dying out in our generation? Because it's kind no, of like they're, the they need a, they need a remar- they're going to need to remarket themselves and try to hit the youth better. But it, it, but it, they're not dying. It just has an older demographic. That's it just kind of didn't it. help. That whole scandal didn't help, and this sixty game season didn't help but that that wasn't my point what was your original question yeah as 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 an executive and as marketers for the sport do you really want to see the astros like win the world series again after what they've just been through i don't think anyone in all of sports except for if you're an astros fan want the astros to win the world series yeah exactly they also had an under 500 record this regular season. Yeah. They shouldn't even be in the postseason. I'm very anti-expanded postseason for baseball. But yeah, I didn't like it either at all. I don't think – I think in other sports it works. I don't think in baseball it does. Just because I don't like having teams that are under 500 making playoffs. I don't think that's ever a good thing. I don't like that in the NBA. I think the NBA playoffs should be smaller. But hopefully it gets rid of it. But back to it, no, yeah, no one wants the Astros to win. Also, like yeah. more than half of the league went to the playoffs, right? Sixteen teams out of thirty. Well, yeah, yeah. It, they it, expanded the playoffs. Fun. They expanded the playoffs this season, and in any other season, most likely, it's they're never going to see an under five hundred team make the playoffs. It was mainly because of the sixty game season that a 29 and 31 team was able to go to the playoffs in future seasons with 162 games. There most likely wouldn't be, I mean, weirder things have happened, but there's not going to be a team that's under 500. I'm a fan of expanded playoffs. I think they were able to do it well this season. They could do it better in future seasons where Mm -hmm. you have more teams competing near the end of the regular season to try to fight more. So you have less meaningless games. As an executive with Major League Baseball, there's a lot of positives to the Astros winning the World Series. You have a team that's hated. And when you have a team that's hated, you have developed people who will just watch that team to hate them winning. And you want to see a team lose. You know, that's how the NFL had a lot of success with the anti-Tom Brady, anti-Bill Belichick, anti-Patriots. When he got suspended for four games that one season, there were so many people who hated everything about what Tom Brady did and hated everything about him that they just watched it because of the hatred of Tom Brady and the new England Patriots. So as a marketer and someone who's in major league baseball management, I could for sure see the Astros winning the world series as a good thing because they happen to be a good team who just cheated their way to the world series. They were never bad and just won all their games because of cheating. They were always good who were just able to exploit the sport more by the sign scaling scandal. Yeah, I, I think it kind of brings the age-old phrase of all publicity is good publicity, uh, especially when it comes to MLB. I know personally, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge baseball fan. Um, I've looked into the scandal, and I know if the Astros were playing in the World Series, I would not be tuning in. 
I think it does have the potential to turn a lot of people away from the sport, especially with how it was handled. It just, you know, it makes people not want to watch it. Um, but on the flip side, you can also make the argument, you know, they're the next Patriots. They're the Patriots of the MLB because they, they're, you know, they cheated and they still have success and it will tune people in. I mean, people will want to tune in because of that, but I think you're going to lose more people um, than gain people in that situation if the Astros make the World Series or even win the World Series. I uh, I see where you're coming from. It's just uh, in sports, you always need the guy to hate as the evil villain. You know, in college football, a lot of people just despise Alabama because they've won so many times. In the NFL, it was the Patriots. In basketball, it's either the Warriors or LeBron James. In hockey, many people don't like Sidney Crosby, so they don't like the Pittsburgh Penguins. So baseball well, will not Baseball has the Yankees. Baseball has the Yankees. I know they haven't won recently, but – they already have their evil umpire. I know you'd have multiple, but it's it's not like people are hating them because they were good. People are hating them because they cheated. The people hated the Patriots, not because they cheated that year. I mean, probably a little bit, but because they've won it so many times. I think that's the main difference. It's not like the Astros have just been dominant. It's they they got caught cheating, which is never a good look for a sport where you could say that a team, that one of your champions was a cheater. I understand where you're coming from, but they've always, for the past five years, still had a good team. They have good hitters, and they were able to do good things on the road, and in that cheating scandal, it helped them at home games. So No, they weren't. No, they were not good on the road that season. They were really bad on the road that year. That year, they were not that good on the road. If you look at their splits home and the road, it was very obvious that they were significantly better at home. They lost all three games on the road against the Yankees in the ALCS that year. And in the World Series, they were able to win. They were able to win games on the road. Yeah, but if you just look, you can't just look at one, like, they were bad the entire season. If you look at the splits home versus away, it's, it's very big margin. They were worse on the road, but they were still able to win games in the regular season on the road. No, they were still a playoff-worthy team. You're right on that. They were still a good team. But it's it, it puts an asterisk. And it's not, it's not a good look for the sport. I think you're going to have guys like Josh and Robbie, Sam, who aren't into it and who are against the cheating. And you'll have guys like me who will just – gladly join in to see if they will lose or people who are looking for someone to pull for to lose. And that's yeah, I, I'd agree. I think it's the same people who are very anti them cheating are going to be the same people who are, who don't want Barry Bonds in the world in the hall of fame. It's, it's similar. It's, it's similar. It's all just kind of what type of fan or what type of media member you are to how you look at something. And that's where, you know, you have a lot of people who generally don't care about what the Astros did. And you have people who hate the Astros for what they did to the sport. So it's a very subjective feel to it. I think there's positives and negatives to them going to the World Series if they're able to win the next two against the Rays. Yeah, that, that's a big ask. We will see. Thank you, everyone, for joining in to explain your take this week. Uh, thanks very much to Sam and Robbie for joining us. We'll be back next week and enjoy all of the podcasts on the Sports Me Podcast Network. Thank you. All right.